the north. And among other activities at Cape Coast Castles, uh, the pilgrims will be invited to walk back through the door of no return. Um, and I'll show you some images of that in just a moment. One of the things that I find really interesting about this uh, pilgrimage part of the Joseph Project um, is that in addition, there will be other types of monuments that will be built. One um, which is a garden of commemoration for meditation. This will be at Asimanso. Um, and also an interfaith prayer hall uh, where people can pray for the, quote, spirits of the ancestors. And then the wall of return. Um, and in this wall of return, returnees or pilgrims can actually etch their names in, in this wall of return. And when I think about these kinds of memorials, they remind me of work that's been done by the noted um, architect uh, Daniel Lieberskin, uh, particularly in Berlin, um, at the Jewish Museum, and also Maya Lin's uh, Vietnam War uh, Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention a few more of these uh, activities related to the um, Joseph uh, Project, and then I'd like to also talk about, at least take a moment to, to meditate on what the meaning of anniversaries um, could be. Um, activity number four um, will teach and display local culture and traditions to guys for Africans along the pilgrimage route. And similarly, coming from a place of national pride and recognition, the fifth activity of the Joseph Project, which is called the African Excellence Experience, proposes to transform James Fort in Accra to um, a monument um, about the slave trade. And there will be tours there um, in, in the dungeon. And there's also going to be this story of Joseph that they continue to perpetuate go to the desires and the needs of Roots Tours to know where they've come from and to try and instill pride in, 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 of belonging in, in the youth. And the gene map, I think, is another, um, another area where we might get into a fruitful discussion where they're proposing to um, set up a system whereby they have a database um, that returning um, African-Americans, diasporic Africans, could tap into to see whether or not, in fact, um, they are from um, Ghana or whether their ancestors might have been um, from Ghana. The Joseph Project constitutes what I think is a bold remapping of national memory by arguing for a transnational memory that recognizes the Pan-African roots of the country on the one hand and the history of this by, by Lani about the way in which 2007 has to be about transformation um, and, and that there, ha there have to be transformative uh, possibilities that are embedded in the way in which we, we celebrate anniversaries and the way in which we remember um, um, and the way that, that my colleague Sandra Green said also that there is there's a need to think about how these anniversaries, the celebration of anniversaries, et cetera, um, how we have to think about how we do something to challenge um, higher, power hierarchies that have been in existence, in existence as a result of these histories that we are that we are celebrating. So I just want to quickly move through a few more images um, and these, I've done research in Ghana in 99 and in 2005. Most recently, I went for the inauguration of the NYU in Ghana program, which is in Accra. I'm showing you um, an image of Elmina uh, Castle built by the Portuguese in 1482 from the distance. And this is the fishing village that surrounds it. Um, and this is um, one of the forts that was built to defend Elmina. Um, and a view again of the fishing village that's been there um, for years that surrounds it. And I wanted to take you just briefly on one of the tours that I took with a group of um, returning African Americans who were part of this NYU delegation um, at Elmina. We're, we're being shown the courtyard um, around which enslaved women would have been held and above which um, colonial masters as the narrative is told by the tour guide who's in the blue shirt in the center um, would have chosen concubines um, from women that were below. We were taken, taken um, into the dungeons. Here you'll see many of which have been painted um, also white above. The whitewashing is to help with historic preservation. However, it's been criticized as um, many of you may have heard this term uh, as whitewashing the history of the slave trade or the history of, um, of, the, of the slave trade. And again, this is a group in the dungeons. Um, we're always taken, of course, to the door of you no know, Africans. 
almost as a form of recompense for this wrongdoing. As a recent article in the Sydney Morning Herald reported, and I quote, Project Joseph is an invitation to black people to reconnect with the land of their ancestors, and it comes with an apology, not from the countries most commonly associated with the slave masters or slave traders, but from Ghanaians themselves, end quote. Anniversaries present occasions to reflect upon the past, to mark significant defining moments, both triumphs and tragedies, that define people in the present and suggest their future possibilities. Anniversaries are thus very much part of progress narratives as they commemorate endurance, longevity, and accomplishment. Anniversaries ask questions of historic events like, how far have we come? How have we changed? What have we learned? How have we moved forward? But such questions, no return from which you can see outdoors, um, that life goes on. Um, it's a fishing village, boats are made, um, and children play basketball and football, and um, life goes on outside. When one enters, and this might be somewhat of a comic image, it's also possible to take your picture, as I did here, in front of a painting of um, Elmina, which is done by a very famous local artist who sells this painting here, uh, which is called The Revenge of the Blacks, which shows African resistance to enslavement. And you see, um, it's kind of small here, maybe it's not so small there, but you can actually see that um, there's a couple there that's, uh, that's um, chasing um, with potential captors. There's another one that I don't have a slide of where you actually see um, uh, the, the, uh, the captors uh, taking the couple into uh, Armina. I'm taking you quickly here to Cape Coast Castle. It's the exterior, you can see the, the, white, the whitewashing, um, which is a continual process. And again, the very infamous Door of No Return, which at Cape Coast Castle has been renamed on the exterior, the Door of Return. And this has been symbolic of an invitation to uh, diasporic Africans to quote unquote, return home. Not in there. Thank you very much. Carolina and Georgia, and they are known for preserving more of their African language and cultural heritage uh, than any other African American community in the United States. For the last 30 years, I've been going back and forth between Sierra Leone and the Gullah region, doing research on the historical links between Sierra Leone and the Gullahs, and sharing my findings with people on both sides of the Atlantic my findings and those of others uh, who have worked on this connection between Sierra Leone and the wider rice coast of West Africa and the South Carolina and Georgia Low Country. So bringing research findings as well uh, to people on both sides from Lorenzo Turner to Peter Wood uh, to Daniel Littlefield to more recently uh, Judith, Judith Carney. I've been sharing the information about the special links between Sierra Leone and the Gullah people, but at the same time, over these past 30 years, I've been directed in my own research and my own public history work by people, uh, especially in Sierra Leone. Uh, I found people on both sides, but particularly in Sierra Leone, were very excited about these connections, and it became clear that people had very strong opinions as to where they thought the research should go and what its impact should be. Uh, beginning uh, back in the 1980s at the request of the Sierra Leone government, uh, I began to help forge modern reconnections between these two groups. In 1988, I worked in five. Uh, while in the middle of all this, watching, fascinated, engaged uh, with people on both sides, I saw the effect, both among Sierra Leoneans and Gullahs, uh, of this new history as they were taking it in. I also saw how it affected the identity of people on both sides. Um, Sierra Leoneans and Gullahs, like all communities, are in the process constantly of redefining themselves in changing circumstances. Both groups, I think, in recent years have been under particular stress, and so perhaps there was more urgency uh, to their redefining uh, themselves. And so I saw each group take in this new information and process it uh, in their own way. Uh, I saw each change and strengthen and deepen their collective identity, their sense of, of collective identity, with this new historical information. And so I had an opportunity to witness uh, firsthand, I, had, I must say, uh, all the uh, academic language aside, a very exciting opportunity uh, to witness firsthand um, the powerful impact 
uh, that uh, public history can have in the lives of ordinary people. I have to say that I did not start out uh, to do this sort of work. Uh, public history was really not on my mind when I was a student or beginning my career. I was sort of drafted into it. Uh, I began research way back in 1976 on a slave castle in Sierra Leone called Bunce Island. Um, it's an extremely isolated spot. It's unlike the ca most of the castles, certainly the well-visited castles in Ghana or in Senegal. It's on an isolated island 20 miles up a, an African river. Uh, and an African historian years ago, a Sierra Leonean historian, had referred to Bunce Island as a place where history sleeps. When I began research there, it was initially a matter of cutting back the tropical vegetation so you could see the walls. And I spent weeks at a time on the island cutting back the vegetation, photographing and mapping the ruins and doing what archaeologists do, looking at every niche and every uh, construction feature that might tell me what the castle had looked like. While I was there, Sierra Leoneans heard about my research and they came to the island. Uh, Americans and Europeans based in Sierra Leone's capital city of Freetown would come out on weekends, and I noticed right away they were all asking me the same question. Where were the people taken away from Bunce Island taken? And I have to be uh, honest and tell you that question had actually not really occurred to me. Uh, my original training was in archaeology, and I saw the project as one of uh, uh, an archaeological exploration. I didn't know about historical research, and I assumed at the time that it would probably be impossible to know where these people were taken. I assumed the records were not there. Uh, my interest did not even go there to where these people were taken until I began to do oral history research on the island. Uh, back in 1976, I rented a canoe. Uh, and went from Bunce Island, where I was camped, out onto the neighboring islands where there were fishing villages, no schools, people there could not read and write, had no notion of formal history. And the very first island I arrived at, the chief of the island, I asked him, I said, I've come here to ask you and the other elders, and I pointed back at Bunce Island, I said, if you know anything about the time the white people were there at Bunce Island. I deliberately didn't mention slavery, and when you're doing oral history, you want to prompt people, obviously, to tell you their side of things, uh, so I didn't provide a lot of information. And to my amazement, this elderly chief on this village just looked at me and said, we don't know anything. And he pointed downriver toward the sea, and he said, all we know is they took our people in that direction, and they never came back. And he said, and we know since they never came back, they all died. And I, I laughed. I thought he was making a joke. I surely he knew they didn't all die. And, he, and I, when I realized he was serious, I said, Chief, they, they didn't all die. I said, many people died on those voyages, but many more survived. And I said, I'm from the United States, uh, and there are millions of black people in my country. And he said, they're still alive? And I said, well, yes, of course. Many of them are still alive. And he said, my people from here? And I said, many of them from here, I'm sure. And he threw his arms around me. And he said, thank you, thank you, thank you for this wonderful news. And it was completely disorienting for me to bring information from 200, 250 years ago, and he was calling it news. And he asked me to spend the night in my village, please, my fishermen will be home uh, by early evening, tell them this wonderful news. And I spent the night there, and he did, he, he brought together all the people in the village that evening under the moonlight. And I thought, surely they're not going to be interested in my story. This is all a bunch of dry history. And then I realized, kind of panic. I don't know what to tell them. They, they want to know where their people went. They don't want to hear some generalized history. And I, and I had been trained in anthropology. All I could do was give them my high school history of cotton plantations in Alabama. Uh, and I knew that had to be wrong. I felt certain that since the vast majority of Africans went to the Caribbean Basin and to Brazil, it must be somewhere there if you could trace it at all. But all, the only history I knew then was uh, African American history. And I felt like I had cheated them. I felt I want to go back now and look into the history and see if it's possible to pinpoint at least some areas where many of the African captives taken from Bunce Island went. The last thing I thought was that the connection would be North America, uh, since so many of the Africans, such a high percentage, went to the Caribbean Basin in Brazil. But when I got back to the United States, I found 
uh, what was then not a very old book, Peter Wood's Black Majority, and saw for the first time that many Africans were taken from the rice coast of West Africa, including Sierra Leone, into the low country of South Carolina and Georgia because the economy of that area at that time was based on rice. And I learned that rice had been one of, if not the most lucrative industry in early America and that much of the success of that industry was based on African know-how. I began to dig deeper and I began to find specific references to Bunce Island, specific links between Sierra Leone and the Low Country. I found in the papers of Henry Lawrence, that Henry Lawrence, who later became president of the Continental Congress, was in fact Bunce Island's exclusive agent in Charleston for 20 years before the war. I learned later still that Bunce Island had a permanent agent in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, I learned that many ships that did not pass through Bunce Island, but the purchased captive Africans in Sierra Leone also went to South Carolina and Georgia. I discovered in the works of Lorenzo Turner that there were many Sierra Leonean words, Mende, Timni, uh, Vi words in the Gullah language in South Carolina. I learned that Turner, as late as the 1930s, had collected songs and story fragments in the Mende language of Sierra Leone among Gullah people. And I was astonished at the specificity of the connection, and I wanted to go back. To Sierra Leone, and I wanted to see the chief again and tell his people uh, that there is actually an interesting place you could point to. And the fact that the Gullahs had preserved so much African culture and that so much of it comes from the Rice Coast area meant I knew that Sierra Leoneans could relate to Gullah culture, to their language, to their rice eating customs, and so many other things. And then I found yet another collection connection that many of the Africans who returned. Um, African Americans, uh, I should say many of the Africans or freed slaves who returned to Sierra Leone were in fact from the South Carolina and Georgia low country, including the famous Nova Scotians uh, who had fought for the British in the American Revolutionary War, and even the founder of Sierra Leone's great university, uh, Four Bay College, was an educated black man uh, from Charleston named Edward Jones who came in the 1830s. So I knew I had a story to tell. And when I returned to Sierra Leone in 1985 to teach at Fort Bay College, I gave one lecture at the United States Embassy, expecting some mild interest, but the interest was explosive. The next day, all the newspapers in Freetown were filled with stories of what now the press was calling the Gullah Connection, the Gullah <laughs> Connection. Uh, and uh, every newspaper wanted to interview me, magazines, the television, uh, the radio. Uh, and it suddenly, this became an evergreen story. They, the press were constantly telling me, we want more information. And I became a kind of public historian immediately by default. And as I walked through the streets of Freetown, a lady selling fish from a pan on her head who had no education would ask me in the local language all the same questions that highly educated Sierra Leoneans would ask me in perfect Oxford English. Uh, and I became a kind of walking questionnaire. I knew what it was that Sierra Leoneans were interested in knowing about their lost family because I heard so many questions time and time again. <laughs> many of their questions pointed to who they were, how their own identity. They were looking for things that in the Gullah that in their minds defined them as Sierra Leoneans. They asked about their rice dishes, and some of the Gullah's rice dishes even have the same names as those in Sierra Leone. That uh, really pleased people. About their naming practices, and the Gullahs with their basket names, some of them clearly are from Sierra Leone. Uh, about secret society initiation, uh, and the Gullah tradition of Sikan is very similar to secret society initiation in Sierra Leone. And of course, they have their Creole language in Sierra Leone, and Gullah and Sierra Leone Creole uh, have, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, striking similarities. And so I could see the pleasure that this brought to Sierra Leoneans, seeing that there, were, there was a people across the sea who shared many things in common with them. Um, when they saw all of these similarities in the Gullah, I could also see an adjustment being made in the way Sierra Leoneans saw their own country. They're a very small country, five million people. I think people knew instinctively that there was little chance of people from their country leaving any cultural impact in the Americas because they were so few in number. So to learn that there was a place where people from their region had been concentrated and that some identifiable aspects of their own culture and language were still there gave them a sense of the durability and strength of their culture that they had not had before. 
And you've heard wonderful comments to the effect that I didn't know we were so strong. I didn't know our culture was so strong. You also heard comments of pride at the impact of their people in the outside world. Yes, they were enslaved, but they helped create a great industry, the rice industry in early America. And also a new sense of national identity. Uh, they did, the Creole people in Sierra Leone, the descendants of the freed slaves, have always been thought of as foreigners, uh, as settlers. But to learn that many of their ancestors had come from here gave Sierra Leoneans a sense that really, a new sense that perhaps they were all one people after all. Um, right away, people began to press me. Uh, people in high and low places press me. Can't you do anything uh, to bring the Gullah people here or make it possible for us to meet them? Uh, I was had no clue at first, and then the president of Sierra Leone called me into his office uh, and said he was going on an official visit to the United States uh, and as he put it, I want to see those Gula people. Uh, and uh, I said to Mr. President, that's Gula at least 30 times, but it remained Gula. So even now when I'm speaking the local language, I say Gula. There's no escaping it. But I helped organize a, uh, a, a trip for the President of the United States, working with the U.S. State Department, uh, to um, St. Helena Island, South Carolina. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But what ultimately happened were three Gullah homecomings to Sierra Leone. The first one happened in 1989. It was simply called the Gullah Homecoming. There were 13 Gullah community leaders uh, who came to Sierra Leone for a week of national celebration. They were mobbed in the street. The Gullah visitors said, we feel like movie stars. Uh, every place they went, to, people wanted to, to see them. And once they were there, I realized here's another dimension of this connection I had not understood, a spiritual dimension. And I first realized it when our bus was stopped in traffic and hundreds of Sierra Leoneans gathered around the bus and just row upon row, people behind people behind people, lifted their hands to the windows quietly and amazingly for Sierra Leoneans in a public scene, reverently, just to touch these people. And I began to realize that what they thought they were, in their minds, what they were seeing were living ancestors uh, return, and that they were taking a blessing from the return of these ancestors. Sierra Leoneans symbolized this in a number of ways. When they took them to Bunce Island, uh, the leader of the group, Emory Campbell, was anointed on his forehead with soil from Sierra Leone as a symbol that he and his people had been returned to the soil of the country. Uh, never to be separated again, and they called on the collective ancestors, our common ancestors, not to allow that family to be separated uh, again. And I must say, the old chief had survived to be there for that first homecoming, and he burst through the crowd of cabinet ministers on the island, uh, and he pointed up to the vultures that were swarming overhead, as they do in meetings like this, and he said, you see, it's a sign from the ancestors that they are pleased. And then I'll never forget this. He pointed to the Gullah group and he said in Timney, his own language, he said, look, and he was talking to the ancestors, he said, look at your magnificent progeny, uh, which was the way it was translated by a professor of linguistics from the university. Well, I made a documentary film working with South Carolina Educational Television on this visit called Family Across the Sea. When it was shown at the American Embassy in Freetown, uh, twice a day for 10 days. On the last day, when it was not to be shown again, I came out of the embassy and saw about 100 adults sitting on the embassy steps weeping that they had missed their chance. And seeing scenes like this, I, I knew it was important, but when you participate in these events, you don't realize until you're in the midst of them how deeply felt uh, these reconnections are uh, from this enormous uh, outpouring of feeling. I thought I had done something pretty great. I had done what so many people had asked me to do and worked hard with the American Embassy and the Sierra Leone government, fellow community leaders to make this thing happen. And then to my surprise, and I'll, I'll just summarize this, people came up to me very soon after this big national event and said, we are disappointed. This is not what we had hoped for. And I, I was shocked and I said, what do you mean disappointed? And they said, well, those Gullah leaders, they were wonderful, but do you know, you know their ancestors came from Sierra Leone? And I said, well, if you look at the percentages of people taken from this area to Charleston, it's not like a historian. They said, forget about that. Do you know? And I said, well, you can't know. I mean, we're working with records. They didn't take names and 
people lost their identity. You don't realize what people went through in this transformation. They were deliberately stripped of their identity. None of these arguments meant anything. Uh, they said, find us somebody that you know, especially a family in South Carolina or Georgia. And I remembered that way back in the 1930s, Lorenzo Turner, the African-American linguist, had found a Gullah woman, Amelia Dolly, on an island off the coast of Georgia who could sing a song in the Mende language of Sierra Leone. It was a long shot, and of course it was something I never would have done without Sierra Leoneans pointing me in that direction. I was able to get a copy of Turner's original 1931 recording of this song in Mende, uh, and with the help of the Sierra Leonean linguist and an American ethnomusicologist, uh, we went into the Mende country. Uh, there was a dialect word in that song that helped us pinpoint what part of Mende country. And lo and behold, after playing that song, 60-year-old recording from Georgia, in about a hundred Mende villages. Uh, in one village, people began to sing along with the song from the very first word. Uh, we had thought, the linguist and I, from the translation, that it surely was a funeral song. And when we asked the lady who seemed to know more about the song than anyone what kind of a song it was, she looked at us as if we were idiots and said, it's a funeral song. As if anyone would know that. Uh, and we found that it was actually a part of an important um, ceremony at graveside ceremony that had not been performed for about 60 or 70 years in that area after people became Christians and Muslims in that area. It was banned. They called it a pagan song. But one particular family had remembered it as a family heirloom uh, and had passed it down at least within one village. We never found it anywhere else. We arranged during a lull in Sierra Leone's civil war for a family, the family, uh, and I should say, we, then we went to Georgia to see if we could find any descendants of Amelia Dolly. We found her daughter, Mary Moran, then 67. She remembered her mother's song. And I should tell the wonderful story. I asked her, how, how in the world do you remember your mother singing a song? She remembered when Professor Turner was there. Mm -hmm. I said, how can you remember that from 1931? And she said, he gave my mama $20 for singing that song. That was the depression. <laughs> So of course you're going to remember that. Uh, and during a lull in the fighting in Sierra Leone, we were able, with the help of the government of Sierra Leone and the United States Embassy, to bring Mrs. Moran, Amelia's daughter, and members of her family to Sierra Leone. It was a lull in the Civil War, just a break in the fighting. We thought it had ended. And we helicoptered the family to this remote village uh, where the song was still remembered. I have to admit, I felt pretty heroic after that. And making this happen during the war, it was not easy. And then within a week after the Moran family left, people were stopping me in the street and saying, you know, that was wonderful, but we are disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and I, at this point, I said, what the hell do you mean? <laughs> and they said, well, find us an individual. Is it wonderful that undoubtedly Mrs. Moran's ancestors came from here? But we want a name. We want somebody. And I was not really understanding why, this is a 20 year period, why they're pushing me like this. And then lo and behold, it turned out to be possible. I'm sure many of you are aware of Edward Ball's book, Slaves in the Family. Uh, part of his research, Edward Ball is a descendant of South Carolina rice planters. Uh, and in researching the history of the Africans owned by his own family, Ball found a reference to a little girl named Priscilla, who was purchased by one of his ancestors from a slave ship that came to Sierra Leone, from Sierra Leone to Charleston in 1756. Uh, Elias Ball purchased this little girl, took her to his plantation, and Edward Ball was able to find a diary entry about the purchase of the little girl, and then references to her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren in Ball family records, and lo and behold, Edward was able family still living in Charleston today. And there's a wonderful moment in his book, uh, their shocked realization. Uh, that he had identified uh, a, uh, an ancestor from a specific point in Africa. Joe well on that. Okay. Very quickly, let me just say that for Sierra Leoneans, it's a deeply, deeply spiritual uh, experience. Uh, what they were looking for was a specific ancestor because they believed that they could never make amends with those who were lost. They could never free the spirits of those who were lost unless they had a name unless they had someone that they could specifically identify. And when we brought the great, 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 great granddaughter of Priscilla in 2005 to Sierra Leone, I saw something I had not seen in the other homecomings. 
they addressed her by her name, her American name, and then they would always turn to her again and speak to the little girl uh, inside her. And very quickly, since I'm way out of time, on the Gullah side, what I have seen, I think many of you know the Gullah people, their culture is a stigmatized culture. The Gullahs have long been mocked and ridiculed for their language and their rice eating habits. And for them, uh, having this link to Sierra Leone, and I was there when the president of Sierra Leone came to one of their communities, it validated their culture. Instead of it being a, their language and their culture being a substandard and ridiculed version of American culture, what they were seeing is an African president speaking in a version of their language, uh, eating rice along with them, and what you had now was an anchor for that, not simply a, a subject of ridicule uh, that people hid within their communities because they were tired of being ridiculed, but something that was a source of pride and a source of an ability, it gave them the ability now uh, to be rooted in a particular uh, heritage uh, in Africa. Can I just run through these very quickly? I missed the hate. Here's, here's Sierra Leone, very small country in West Africa. This is Bunce Island. This is a drawing of Bunce Island in the year 1805. This is a uh, computer-generated image of the castle uh, that I've been working on with a computer artist at James Madison University where I teach. Uh, the the uh, low country of South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, an advertisement placed, you see the name Henry Lawrence at the bottom, placed by Lawrence in the South Carolina Gazette uh, in 1760. Africans from the Rice Coast. Uh, and you see the name of the ship, Vance Island. Uh, this is a ship coming directly from the castle. Uh, this is from Georgia in the 1790s, Savannah, and you see again from Bunce Island directly into Savannah. A uh, famous painting of Africans on probably a rice plantation in South Carolina shows the African life they were able to make for themselves there. Uh, a photograph uh, from around 1900 and the famous sweet rice basket and carrying a load on her head. Uh, this is Emory Campbell. Um, greeting President Momo of Sierra Leone. Emory is speaking in Gullah. The president uh, immediately stopped eating his dinner when he heard the words in Gullah, so similar to Creole, and immediately stood up and with great enthusiasm said, that's so much like our Creole language in Sierra Leone. This is the day the Gullahs were taken to Bunce Island, and uh, Sierra Leoneans knew it would be a hardship for them, and so they put this wonderful sign on the boat in their language, uh, Wigola, Broda, and Sista. Salon na una home. Our Gullah brothers and sisters, Sierra Leone is y'all's home. Uh, this is a, uh, a pouring of a libation at what would be Bunce Island's point of no return, the end of the jetty where thousands stood before being put aboard the slave ships. Uh, and you see the Gullahs there with the local paramount chief and the local media. Uh, this is the shock reaction of the first Gullah group, the Gullah homecoming. They are actually standing in the men's slave yard completely enclosed by its walls and understanding its meaning. Uh, several said that we could actually see our ancestors here. <coughs> uh, Mary Moran, the, descent, the daughter of, of Amelia Dolly, who had preserved the Mende song. And this here she is, the woman in yellow, is a woman who had preserved the song in Sierra Leone, Bendu Jabati. You see Mary's son, Wilson, wiping away a tear. Uh, this is their moment, their actual moment of meeting. Uh, and, and this is Kamala and Polite, the great, 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 great granddaughter. Uh, and I wanted to say that uh, this, her case, and, and unless someone knows of another, and this is the best place to announce it, as far as I know, this is the only case of an unbroken paper trail of 250 years. Uh, after Edward Ball's research, I was able to locate the slave ship records and the records of the sale in Charleston. So we have actual records generated in Sierra Leone aboard the slave ship the record of the sale, which specifically mentions Priscilla as a little girl sold to Elias Ball, and then uh, the diary entry of Ball and generations of records on the plantation linking Priscilla directly to Tomlin. Uh, her arrival at the airport, the Minister of Culture presents her with a traditional coconut. Uh, the Freetown players, and I want to say my, the next speaker, Charlie Hafner, has been my colleague now for 25 years and was a part of every one of these homecomings. Charlie's group, uh, make uh, original songs on Sierra Leone history, and due to their efforts in large measure, the news about the connection with the Gullahs has gone far and wide all over Sierra Leone. This is a song about Priscilla's coming home, and you 